fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And I'm Al Warren. And uh, on the East Coast, we have Mr. David Rose Martini. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, I kind of... It's a new came, name. Yeah, it came to me, and I thought, that kind of sounds good. David Rose Martini. It doesn't sound so serial killer. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm going to take I mean, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, that could be your, your writing name, your pen yeah. name. Pen name. David Rose. That could be all your... Pseudonym. Smut books you could reuse. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm going to write those on the side. Yeah. Your wife's going to leave you when she reads this book. She is. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready to be sued. Mm. Uh, i tell you. Well, now, today we go into the writing world, but we're going into, um, I guess, fantasy is what we'll say. We'll, we'll um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's how else to describe it, you know, but I'm an old guy, so I don't, I don't know things. Um, so, joining us today is, is author Anna J. Walner. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Anna, here we are. Uh, how do you describe your writing? Like, what, what category do you put yourself in? Paranormal romance uh, is what I would say best describes my writing um, genre, as well as urban fantasy, because it is set in contemporary times and in a contemporary location. I, I'm sure having a, you know, again, it's my age, I'm sure having an issue with all the fiction categories out there. Um, there's, I, I get, you know, those medical thrillers, there's, 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 there seems to be like a hundred of them, and I keep getting inundated with these and I, I don't know what to say I just it all falls under the fantasy umbrella and under the fantasy umbrella there are quite a few categories so it all depends on you know it's uh, also werewolves and shifters so you have to factor that in then you have magical realism so I thought uh, for the purposes of the Allure Legacy series, paranormal romance and urban fantasy uh, fit the book as a genre. Well, for us, us nonfiction writers, what, so how would you describe an urban fantasy? Like what, what should I expect out of a book like this? It holds uh, fan fantasy elements. So we have characters that are of a supernatural variety, paranormal uh, vampires and lycanthrope, but they exist in the modern world in modern times. And the way the book is written, it's blended with a bit of science in that a way that the characters are believable and that you could truly imagine that the secret society in the outback of Australia really does exist and that they could be walking among us and we would never know. Well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, so, when, you, when you get a book like that, uh, okay, so let's go this way. Um, did you have a paranormal experience or do you have some sort of mystical belief patterns that or things that have happened to you in your life that you incorporate it into this book? Is that sort of how you get into writing these, these kind of fantasies? I... No, it's not exactly uh, the case. I'm very open-minded when it comes to most everything. I don't think that I can necessarily rule anything out in this world. You know, we've all experienced things that defy explanation at times. And so it really was just a way for me to tell my adoption story in a very unique an interesting way so I gave my adoption story to the main character Amelia and had her take the DNA test and reconnect with her biological family who just happens to be this secret society of um, 
of supernatural creatures. Now, with romance, uh, you know, I, I think readers are, are trying to, you know, my theory at least is trying to re-experience uh, feelings of infatuation through the characters. And I'm just what, uh, mm-hmm. wondering what your uh, take is on the appeal of uh, the, the paranormal elements within romance, within that genre. I think vampire. I think vampires have always been very closely associated with the sensual element. Mm. I mean, ever since we've seen, you know, the uh, even even the old classic literature that uh, features them as part of the love interest, it's always a very sensual connection that the male vampire has with the female in the story. So I think it's that element of something very outside of the box in terms of um, relationships. Mm. (laughs) Certainly not your (laughs) typical relationship. And so that's, it it makes it exciting for the reader to see how that all plays out. Now, uh, I've sort of flipped that role in that uh, Amelia is actually the vampire in the story. So it's not the, it's not your typical male vampire falls for human love interest. Um, sort of story that we've seen over and over again. I grew tired of reading those books, and they say that if you can't find the book you want to read, you should write it. So I did. <laughs> there you go. Um, so what comes first for you? Is it the story or the characters? It's really the story. It's the idea of the kernel of truth. Sometimes it's a simple sentence that I can't get out of my head that just resonates so vibrantly that I put it down on the computer and it takes on a life of its own. It's a starting point where it just grows into 50,000 pages or 50,000 words. And then, you know, from there I go in and make the characters have a little more depth and do some refining when it comes to character development. I am very character-centric when it comes to my writing because I believe as a reader, if I can become invested in your characters, then I will follow them through whatever they go through. So it really is creating that bond between the reader and the character that I focus on. So where do your characters come from? Are they completely uh, made up out of the blue, or is it some of you in each character, or is it someone you've seen at a bus stop? Like, where do, where do the characters come from? Amelia really is patterned after me uh, in a lot of different ways. Not only her origin story, uh, but also the way that she is very strong-willed and independent and she knows her own mind she's grown into and you will see some more personal growth throughout the series but she really has grown into a strong-willed independent young woman and she knows her own mind now the other characters are really just a product of my own imagination what i would say a sister would be like no, Lindsay, this is not uh, patterned off of you. Um, they are, they're completely made up. And some of these, these secondary characters in the book really took on a life of their own that I never foresaw happening. And then I ended up making them primary characters. So it's always fun whenever, whenever those surprises happen. I don't necessarily plan everything out. Well, I'm wondering, uh, when, you, when you're writing these characters... Uh, do, can you hear the characters' voices in your head? I know I hear voices, so that's, that's, what, that's the joke, the running joke there. But um, do you have an inner monologue in your head that you're, that you're writing from, or are you looking at uh, more images in your mind or symbols uh, when you're transcribing your story to the page? It's more writing it as a reader. I mean, it really is truly building the narrative as I go, and I control the narrative. I control the way that the story is going, and so I will. My my dialogue uh, actually is out loud, so I wait until my daughter, I have a two-year-old, and I wait until she's in bed, and I will practice the dialogue itself out loud to myself in my bedroom, which is where I write. It's the only mm safe space in the house that she can't um, get to the computer yet. And so, uh, but yes, I will practice the dialogue out loud, but I have a, uh, a minor in psychology. So that has helped me to 
kind of make these characters more believable, what would a person truly do in this situation? How would they react as a... So it brings a bit of authenticity to the character. Well, that's interesting. Um, do, you, do you worry about um, exposing or putting yourself into a character and having some of your own feelings come out to the public? Oh, it's very cathartic uh, having that happen, actually. So I've written myself into, uh, as Amelia's character, I've written her into some situations that are very similar to mine, and I've written her right out of them. And it's it's amazing to be able to lend that authenticity and that experience that I've had with that particular situation to the story. And I think that's enjoyable for readers as well. That's one of the main compliments that I get from readers who have read the book is how much they do connect with Amelia as the main protagonist and the main character. Hmm. So now this is part of a series, I see. So this is book one. Um, what is the series about? The series is about Amelia taking over her birthright. So she was given away for adoption when she was just a baby. And then after so long now, she has been called back to join the colony. And she finds that things are not exactly as she thought they were. There may be possibly a hidden agenda that she's just now being made aware of or will be made aware of. And she's an integral part of that, bringing two colonies together, two separate social communities, vampires and lycanthrope, as one uh, cohesive group in the colony is what the main mission of the Aluru Legacy series is. When you start to write a, a series like this, the Legacy series, have you got this all lined up? Have you got it all outlined? Do you know how many books it's going to be, where it's going to go? Is it all sort of outlined? Or, or how do you, how do you, how do you um, go about starting something like this? No, I didn't. I really honestly had planned for this to be a three-book series and for it to end there. And then I reached the end of the last book, and whether it was a selfish need to keep those characters alive and continuing on their journey, I didn't want to let them go. And I realized that I saw the opportunity for a fourth book and to fully wrap things up. I see the endings and I see certain scenes in my mind play out like a movie. And so I knew that there would be a fourth. I have notebooks that I keep next to me in the bed and insomnia is something that plagues quite a few writers I'm one of them and so I will be in bed thinking and I say oh that's an amazing uh, an amazing thing that I would like to incorporate into the book so I do have these bullet points that I will make that I know I need to hit but as far as having a firm outline it is not like that at all it's it's very much subjective to the characters' wins. Sometimes they go off on their own. Have you found any uh, particular challenges in, in specifically writing uh, paranormal romance fiction? I think finding a way to do it where the reader is surprised is the most challenging mm. because we have all been exposed to, it is such a very popular genre for a reason. People enjoy reading it. However, I do find that certain aspects of it you will see repeated and to keep that fresh and to keep it thoroughly unique, to have those things that make the reader say, this is I haven't, I've never read anything like this before. That's always a challenge to think mm. outside of the box. So, Well, how, how do you do that? Every genre has its conventions. Mm. Um, how, how do you keep uh, your, your writing and your stories fresh? I really do think of the craziest possible thing 
<laughs> and then I dial it back, and then I dial it back, and then yeah. I dial it back. So when I'm, and I, I think that's something that actually Pixar uh, put out a thing on, you know, if, whenever you're stuck in a storyline, you go to the most extreme. So you put your vampires on the moon. And then you say, okay, well, that's not going to work. So let's bring them back to Earth, and then let's, let's you know, figure out what we need to do from there. And then you say, well, we can put them in the subway. Okay, that's not going to work. So it really is a process of, of really taking it as far as you can push it mm. and then kind of dialing it back into the land of believability. Mm. And then so you kind of – you really do have to push yourself in terms of, of thinking outside of the box and creative thinking – and I do have some amazing friends who are in the writing community who will I can bounce ideas off of. So that's that has been an amazing thing to have. That's great. Um, how do you keep track of your storylines and your characters? Do you have a, a process for that, um, tools that you use? Just the notebook. Mm. You know, uh, the, the notebook that I keep, on um, on the side of the bed, it's filled with all sorts of sometimes incoherence and <laughs> because it's in the <laughs> middle of the night and I don't want to turn on the light. So uh, it's filled with all sorts of different things from that, that never made it into the book or that did make it into the book but were slightly tweaked in a way or... You know, that's that's really how I keep track of it. And a lot of it is in my mind as well. Because by the time you've gotten to a finished product, you've run through so many different versions of proofreading that you can nearly recite the entire book. Do you have any uh, hobbies or activities that um, inform your work and that you draw uh, and create story from? My uh, personal hobbies really segue that much into the Allure Legacy series. Uh, we uh, we do a lot of fishing in my family, okay. uh, and uh, so they're they're in the middle of the Australian back, uh, outback. So we don't we don't see a lot of fishing there. Um, I'm in. Uh, I, I did incorporate uh, some aspects of living in Texas because Amelia is from Texas. So there are a few subtle um, subtle things there that are sort of preconceived notions about about Texas. We make a few jokes in the book about <laughs> where are all of the cows or where are all of the horses. I, I, I thought everyone rode horses and there's nothing but cars on the freeway. And so, you know, we, we do take a few little jabs here and there, but that's about as close to my my real life hobbies and, and real life as it as it gets because it is you know, it is very much a fantasy world interesting so now I, I i wonder about this now so under you see under under the book like so after besides the story itself is there some underlying subtext that you want people to get or take away from the stories or from the books there is if you read carefully there is an underlying theme of acceptance of two different cultures actually several different cultures by the time we get to the end of the legacy, you will see other uh, other supernatural beings that are introduced, and it is really an overall theme of acceptance, not only of other cultures, backgrounds, ethnicities. They try and incorporate as much diversity into the characters and into the narrative as possible, but also acceptance of yourself and the way that Amelia accepts the challenges that are thrown at her and she does so while still maintaining true to her morality and I tried to give I tried to write for my daughter a strong female character that has strong morals and beliefs and she never sacrifices those even when she has the opportunity to take the easy way out when the the more difficult way is to do it as a leader, as a strong, independent woman. And so that's really what I want readers to take away from uh, from the character. What, so what do you love about this story? 
everything. <laughs> um, I, 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 I mean, really, it's, uh, it's been a joy to create the entire series and to walk alongside the characters as they grew into their own and as they went on their own adventures and got themselves into trouble and out of trouble, as they fell in love, as they experienced things for the first time, as we see how, you know, life and death plays out and just being able to take that journey along with them. When I was growing up, that was my primary means of escape is to read. I was always that that young girl who had uh, her nose in the book. And so it's still to this day I enjoy reading literature and writing. So so you're saying as a kid, so where did it start for you? Like how did how did you become a writer? I think being a writer was a natural progression from just continuing my love of reading and of literature. I've kept a journal Ever since I can remember, I have some from probably sixth grade. And Hunter Slayton, I still am mad at you for not asking me to dance at that, you know, uh, <laughs> party. You know, I, it's really I, I've 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 kept all of those, and they're they're hidden away somewhere uh, for nostalgic reasons. But I think just. It's a natural progression for me to continue to dabble in the act of writing. I wrote for the newspaper in school, and then I wrote some short stories along the way. And they never, I never really did anything with them, but I found joy in just writing them and getting that story down. And I would share them with people just, you know, for them to enjoy people in my life. And, uh, then I really took the risk to create something big with the Allure Legacy series. Hmm. I wonder, but you know, what, what was um, what was the catalyst that um, gave you the courage to actually decide that you could publish something, like to send it out and have someone publish your work? I got angry. I got very upset with my own limitations I was putting on myself. I felt, uh, as a lot of authors do in the beginning, that negative self-talk and saying, this isn't good, this isn't, you know, you don't have the talent. And then I read it and I reread it and I kept working on it. And I sent it to a friend, Dina, and uh, she's on she's on TikTok, and I sent her the the manuscript, and I said, just take a look at this because you you read, you know you read these amazing books, and uh, if anybody is going to tell me if it's good or not, it's you. And she came back and she said, Anna, I just finished The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. I like this better. And I said, okay. Sold. Uh, I'm going to put it out there and see what it does. And so far, I've been very pleasantly surprised with the reception that it's had. It made the uh, number one bestseller on uh, Barnes and Noble for Nook. Mm. Yeah. So, so, is it important to you that um, you have good reception or good good sales? Is that sort of a, a goal for you? It's necessarily a requirement. I don't think that any book will truly hit everyone's flavor palette the same. And that's perfectly fine. You know, you and I most likely have different tastes in music, um, different tastes in food, so not everyone is going to like the same books. And so I absolutely understand that there are some readers that will connect with the book and some that necessarily won't. And that's a difficult thing for to understand going into it is that not everyone is going to love it, but those that do will really love it, and vice versa. Those who really don't like it really will not like it. <laughs> Are you worried about, uh, you know, the social media aspect of the world now, you know, how everyone's online and, you know, uh, Facebook and Instagram and all that sort of thing? Do you sort of um, do you interact with that quite well, or are you a little bit nervous about it? 
No, I do interact with it quite well. And uh, it's a constant, it is a constant effort to be updating your uh, information. So once you have a new graphic, you know, it needs to be shared everywhere. And so you need to make sure that, that is done. Interacting with the community, if someone comments on your post, getting to that in a timely fashion, I think is just a great way to interact with authors on a different level that we have not really seen. We've seen it grow now uh, during this past year and a half due to certain circumstances. We've been limited to use social media and leverage it in any way that we can. So authors are becoming more interactive on social media with their readers and I think that's a trend that we'll continue to see even when in-person book signings are allowed again and we get back to quote-unquote normal. I'm wondering um, uh, who your influences are and if you have any influences that might be uh, surprising to your fans. Yes. So uh, <laughs> my big influence would have to be a writer from, she is an author, Suzanne Morrison. Very few people know of her. She is a small Texas author, and I read, I picked her book up at the library because I thought it was about something completely different, and it's called Galveston, a novel. And Galveston is right down the street from where I live in Houston. Hmm. So... It was just so beautifully written and so, you know, uh, redolent with historical facts that it drew me in. And I said, I just, I can't believe that I've never heard of this person or this book. And this small town Texas author could write something this amazing. Do I have the capability to do that as well? And I recently had the opportunity to speak with her over the phone, and she really encouraged me to just keep pursuing, you know, that goal of writing and to get those, what they say, the 10,000 hours in and to really grow your voice as an author. And I think that's how, that's how everything really began, started, and now it's, I do see a, a difference in my, my writing style, how it's evolved over the series. How, how does it change you when you complete a book like this? The act of completing a book in and of itself is a version of success. Being able to put it out for people to read is a version of success. Having one person buy your book is a version of success. Having one person recommend that book or leave a review on that book is also success. So I would have to say for all intents and purposes, I consider myself a successful author. Well, um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone's level of success is you know, interdependent. So for some, that is making a list or uh, being... Uh, have a, having a title, but for me, it's the simple act of completing the book, putting the book out there for people to read, and it's just a bonus to have people enjoy the book and to talk about the book and recommend it to other people. Absolutely. After after writing um, darker sections of the book, do you, do you have um, a way to decompress, or do you even need to decompress? Can you just move on to the next thing? Uh, how, how does that work for you? There really aren't a lot of dark, dark uh, parts in the book. And I think that's from a standpoint of myself. I'm, I don't consider this to be a real gothic kind of vampire uh, paranormal romance. It's more upbeat. It's more focused on the story of Amelia and Roan and the colony itself. So it's... We do have some parts that are, you know, where contention occurs, and we do have some, you know, dark parts. But really they're not to the point where it's a, um, where it's anything that's shocking 
or that would uh, it's it's very YA. The first two books are very YA appropriate, young adult appropriate, both in terms of uh, content and in terms of language. So I wanted to keep things a little on the lighter side and just an enjoyable read. Um, so what, how do you feel about your characters? You talk about them a lot, and I, and I know we ask a lot of fiction writers, you know, their relationship with their, uh, you know, characters, and a lot of them will say different things, like they're like my children, their family, their, you know, all that. So what's your description of your, of your characters? Like best friends. I mean, they really are, because uh, in, they're always there for me. Whenever I need them, whenever we need to, to visit, then I will reread. Uh, I'm currently working on the fourth and final book in the series. And so I'm doing the final polishing and editing, which is never fun, mm. <laughs> but needs to be done. And, and it is like visiting an old friend to get back into that, that narrative and visit, revisit them. I don't know if I can truly say that uh, the that we'll never see them again. I don't know that. I haven't made that choice or decision yet, but I do know that the Aluru Legacy series will end with the fourth book being the final book. Hmm. So um, a lot of death. No, just uh... <laughs> <laughs> no. Just hopefully a very satisfying uh, wrap up to the ending for all of the characters and for the readers of the series, the fans of the series. Mm. Well, you know, it could always be a dream, right? And they come back, you know. <laughs> you, you know, it could be. There are so many multiple different ways that I've seen others, other authors approach, uh, you know, revitalizing a series or bringing back some of the characters from a series, either from a different character's perspective or from a different time period or something like that. And that's something that I may revisit depending on, depending on a myriad of different things. But uh, at this time, it's, uh, it's, it is time to wrap the series for now. I'm wondering, you're writing a paranormal romance. Are, are there any other genres that you're, uh, interested in writing in, or, or do you plan to stay in uh, paranormal romance and anything else that you've been doing? Yeah, I do take on some side projects, uh, works in progress that are of a different sort. So whether or not it's just as a way to get some story out of my mind, something that I've seen on TV and I want to extrapolate on. So it, I, I consider those writing exercises so I do have several different things that could potentially turn into novels or standalones or a series. So we shall see. I can't give a definite on that because I, um, I do have a soft spot for paranormal romance, for, for fantasy in general, the act of writing. There's something so freeing in being able to lose the constraints of say, a medical thriller where you're, you know, the author really has to do a lot of research or a historical romance where you have to do a lot of that historical research and digging. And although there is quite a bit of science blended in with the fantasy aspects in the Allure Legacy series and history as well, I did have a lot of freedom in writing under that fantasy umbrella, which is why I think I enjoy it so much. So we, we shall see if I stray from that, but uh, for now, it's, uh, it's going to be fantasy. Do you have favorite writers in the fantasy world? Gosh, I, I really don't. I, I, I really don't. And, and the reason that I can say that is that every author's voice is unique. So while I may have a favorite sci-fi um, author, I think Blake Crouch is amazing. While I may have a famous, you know, fantasy writer, let's just say, you know, Sarah J. Moss, I appreciate her books for certain aspects of what she does. Um, 
Jennifer L. Uh, Armentrout for different aspects of the way that she writes. But I think each individual author has, you know, a following and a a voice, the way that they write, that is so unique to them that I have to say there are multiple different favorites I have for multiple different reasons just because of the way that they write. Hmm. Do you find that things around um, you during the time that you're writing these books, like so things going on in the community or stressful things in your life or the pandemic or anything like that, when things like that are going on, do you find that it interferes with your writing? No, if anything, uh, being able to have an excuse to stay home and stay inside and uh, write all the time is um, has been pretty enjoyable. I'm I'm an introvert by by nature, um, so I tend to stay, you know, if, if I can. I'm I, I'm not a big uh, I'm not a big partier. I am not a big um, I don't go to a lot of concerts or sporting events or things of that nature. I like to play video games. Uh, so it really has not uh, impacted me that much. I don't tend to watch television when I am in that writing zone, that writing mode. So I don't watch a lot of TV or movies. And I also don't read when I write because I don't want to be distracted from my own internal narrative and my own voice. How long does it take you to write something like this? It depends. Now, with the first book in the series, Garcane, it was very important that I pay attention to the way the characters were constructed and their character arcs because I knew where the series was going or where the series would be going. I knew where the book would end. I knew on what note it would end. And so it was very important for me to make the reader care about Amelia and Roan and Michelle and Phoebe and Ambrose and Anatole. And so it was very important for me to carefully construct their own unique personas in the first book. And so it did take me a little more time to do the, to to go through the first book. So from about I would say October of last year until March of this year. And then it just released uh, in June. So it was quite the process to get everything just perfect. But the second, third, and fourth books went relatively quickly in comparison. I would say the rough draft of those, now mind you, this is me staying up until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning (laughs) and being extremely exhausted, what I call riding the creative wave. When it comes, you just, you have to go. You you really do. And so they took probably about a month to rough out the the draft, and that's probably a 50,000 word, 60,000 word draft. And then, of course, going back through and adding in more details and adding more depth to certain scenes and to certain characters. When you talked about uh, using uh, notebooks, I'm wondering, do you primarily compose on paper or do you are you more in the in the digital realm when you're when you're writing? No, I I have uh, I have my computer, my laptop, and that is what I write on. Uh, everything is done on the laptop. So, but I do. I have to always have that that pen and paper, just for when it, the inspiration strikes. Now, mm-hmm. if I happen to be driving, <laughs> uh, then um, that that voice assistant is very handy. I have sent so many strange text messages to myself while I've been driving (laughs) using the the voice assistant that does not Mm. understand my Texas accent. So I have to go back (laughs) home and and sort of uh, of, uh, translate my text messages whenever I get home. But, yes, I do find that that keeping a notebook is quite helpful. So I like to have that at the ready when those Mm. ideas strike because the way that I term things and maybe the – 
the fluidity of the sentence, the efflorescence of the of the sentence itself, might mm. get lost if I were to wait to write it down. Hmm. Uh, so, what would your advice be to someone that is currently writing but not published? To keep going, to not be so hard on yourself. I think that's really where a lot of authors get stuck, is not believing that they can do this. Because when you are on page 15 and you know that your goal is a 300-page book, that goal seems insurmountable. But if you just give yourself over to the creative process, the writing process, just trust yourself to put down junk in the beginning. If it is junk, maybe there's something in there that you can go back and look at those first 15 pages and say, I like this piece. We're going to keep that and grow from there. So just go ahead, jump off and start writing, and what you can use out of those first 15 pages, use. Uh, if you don't like the idea, then start over, but never stop, never truly stop, because there is a story inside of you. If you're feeling like you need to tell it, I really do believe that you're the right person to tell that story at that time, and it will come to you when, when you least expect it. I've had you know, ideas come to me when I've been vacuuming or doing the dishes or doing the laundry. And I will stop right then and there and go pick <laughs> up that notepad. <laughs> what, what, so just don't give up. What do you think the hardest thing is about writing or the thing that you find most frustrating? Editing. Mm. Good gracious. And I've come to accept it over the years. <laughs> <laughs> We're not we're not in the on on the best of terms yet, but uh, it is it, it is a necessary evil to go through the editing phase, and it seems to last forever. It is the most laborious and painstaking part of the process, but it is it is also one of the most important parts because you do want to give readers something that is fully polished and enjoyable to read, so. Hmm. Have you, have you ever thought about writing with another writer? I have. Uh, I am working with, we have another writer under our house, Silver Dawn Publishing. Her name is Jenny Lee Petzano, and she is fantastic. Uh, she has a much different writing style than I do. She's, very, she's a poetess first, and she's very effluent in her writing style, very descriptive. And it's so beautiful to read. I have, we have talked about possibly working on a project together. That is still something that has only been bandied about and not committed to. So I've thought about it, uh, but it's not something that I'm actively working on at the moment. Is there anybody out there that you, you would uh, love to uh, meet and work with that you sort of liked? I mean... I wouldn't turn down the opportunity to to co-write with with anyone, say on an anthology or something like that. So uh, I don't typically shy away from projects, especially of a creative nature. I find that that is one of the best ways to really, you know, flex those those muscles of creativity inside the brain. And if they're stagnant for too long, then you kind of lose that. Um, you kind of lose that that flexibility in your you know in your writing and so i always like to be challenged in my writing in a way so yes if i if if i were given the opportunity to to contribute to an anthology or a compendium then i would gladly take that but as far as a particular person I can't necessarily say who. I, 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 I wouldn't have a, a preference. It would just be an honor to be asked to do so, honestly. Have you ever looked back at some of your earlier stuff? and, and Oh, gracious, yes. Yeah, and you ever I you think about rewriting it? or? Uh, I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's, there's an author out there that looks back at their first 
their their first things that they they put down. I mean, I have manuscripts on my laptop, or actually on an external hard drive, that I have written from ten years ago or so that will most likely never see the light of day. But uh, I say, my gracious, how the the you know how my author's voice has changed over time. How I've seen myself grow in in you know being an author. So I think really just putting in that time and really taking those chances to flex those creative muscles, as I said earlier, uh, any chance that you have to do that is wonderful because it gives you a different outlook on a different topic that you can then incorporate into something else. So I look back and I say, oh, wow, I have come so far. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, now, okay, so if people want to find out more about you and maybe send you a note or maybe even work with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, so where do, you, do you ha- where do they get a hold of you? What, what kind of uh, social media and website do you have? Oh, I am uh, everywhere. Uh, I'm on TikTok, on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram. As far as uh, a website, it is AnnaJWalner.com. And everything is at Anna J. Walner. Having a unique name makes it easy to get those at. Um, <laughs> not, no, I, I didn't have to compete with anyone, so it's just at Anna J. Walner. As far as any business inquiries are concerned, that would be Creative Edge, um, Creative Edge Publicity. Well, we'll have all that up on our website, of course, so people can find you with one Absolutely. click. And um, TikTok, what do you do on TikTok? I talk about I talk about books. I talk about uh, I I will put up video trailers and talk uh, about books. Then um, let's see what else. Do you dance on there or anything like that? <laughs> I am not a good dancer. I really am not. I I used to be. I I, I did, but uh, time has 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 gotten me, and I just don't have the flexibility I once did. So, uh, but I do, I, I do like to do at my friends that are on there and, uh, for, for finding people who want to. So I do send out an ARC call. I'm, I'm, I'm now sending out ARCs for advanced reader copies, uh, for the second book in the series. And so I have a lot of fans on there who are more than happy to, so go online and fill out the form to sign up to be on the ARC team. So it's a great forum. Book Talk has really exploded as a place for people who enjoy reading books to get on and discuss the books that they love and why. And it's really taking over in terms of social media, whereas it used to be Bookstagram. And, and there are still a lot of Bookstagrammers out there, but TikTok allows you the ability to make these one-minute videos. They're quick, they're fun. There's not a lot of uh, time to go into a, a great amount of detail, so you get these short clips uh, of condensed reviews, which I think is one of the appeals for uh, for Book Talk and for authors to have their books reviewed on Book Talk. Hmm. So, um, so what's 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 Anna? Jay Walner's biggest secret. Biggest secret. <laughs> oh, God. Boy, the pressure's um, on. Everyone wants to know. I know. We all, everyone I'm, I'm thinking about that. We won't tell I'm anyone. That, I know. I'm thinking about that time that I was dared to steal earrings from the Claire's at the Lufkin uh, Mall. Um, I got in I got in so much trouble I had to go back and, and, and return them and apologize to the store clerk. No, my biggest secret. I think would be um, that I am not as I am not as confident as people perceive me to be. I too have my self doubts. I too have days when I think that I am not good enough. When I have times that are difficult for me to see myself being a writer, being an author full-time. So I think that's my biggest secret. Although when you're on social media, there is that pressure to be 
you know, very confident and appear to have it all together. Guys, I really don't. There are dirty dishes in the sink right now that I need to put in the dishwasher, and I don't plan on doing them today. Oh, boy. So boy that, there you are. Nasty. I am uh, a <laughs> nasty secret. I have my dirty. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Terrible, nasty, dirty secret. Do not go to Anna's house. You'll see dishes in the sink. <laughs> my. Do, so at your, do so at your own peril. Yeah, disgusting. Anyway. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. Um, we're glad you came by. Um, our guest today has been Thank the so author of Gurkane and it's book one of the Eulera series, legacy series. I can I can never say that word. Yeah. It's the Uluru legacy Uluru. series. Uluru is the uh, Aboriginal term for what we in America know as Ayers Rock. Ooh. Well, <laughs> Jesus, I've learned something new. Wow. Yeah. Every day. Well, Anna J. Walner, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be on the show today. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.